Welcome to Winning Conversations, a new podcast brought to you by Heritage of Faith. We're sitting down today with Pastor Phil Thurman, a member of the executive pastoral team here at Heritage. He and his wife serve as pastoral care ministers. They oversee Thrive Groups, marriage ministry, and other small groups throughout the church. Pastor Phil has been pastoring for 41 years, and we are really excited to hear from a minister with such a legacy in the kingdom of God. I'm Tanya. And I'm Andy. And we're ready to jump into this conversation. Pastor Phil, hello. Hello. Um, So I feel like I don't know you very well. Um, So I want to know your background, where y'all are from, you and your wife. Just start by telling your story. Okay. Um, Well, Diane was my high school sweetheart. Aww. Uh, That's (laughs) that's where it started. Uh, Actually, I've known her since I was 15. And uh, we just were friends. And uh, I would occasionally invite her out to go have a Coke. A Coke. You know, go have a Coke. Coke date. (laughs) And uh, we would just sit and visit and catch up. She had boyfriends and I had girlfriends. I mean, we were just just friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, uh, my junior year, uh, my dad had enrolled me into the service. Um, because he thought that the service would help me to mature and grow up. And uh, it did. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, the summer of my, uh, um, after my junior year, I went uh, to boot camp. I was the youngest recruit that they'd ever had at boot camp. Wow. I was only 17 years old. And uh, when I got back, I called her up and we went out on the on a Coke date again. (laughs) Another Coke date. Another Coke date. And um, uh, I had matured so much and everything else when I came to the door uh, to pick her up uh, and everything else. She saw such a a dramatic change and everything else. And so she went, we went up, we went out on on our Coke date. So it didn't end up being a Coke date. We went to uh, a movie and, you know, and just uh, that sort of thing. wasn't much more than what it had been before, but it was just a little bit longer. And uh, when she got home, she went in and told her mama, I'm gonna marry that guy, so. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and uh, so. And did you know you were gonna marry her too? No. No. <laughs> no. No, I had too many other girlfriends. <laughs> at the time. Okay. <laughs> so. Learning uh, more and more things about you. <laughs> just out of the gate. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I went back, uh, went back to Albuquerque, and uh, I stayed in communication with her. And uh, so, but my dad wanted me to go to work instead of play football. I'd already joined the football team in Albuquerque and was already at practice and everything else. I came home one evening, and uh, he knew that I'd been at school and had practice and stuff. And he said. Uh, I told you I wanted you to go get a job. I said, Dad, this is my last year. This is my senior year, and I want to get a scholarship for football. And he said, no, you go work. Oh, man. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And he said, well, you're, you, you think you're a grown man now, so I think you ought to go on your own. And I said, fine by me. So I went and got, uh, got in my car, got all my clothes, put them in my car, and took off. I got about 20 miles away. Realized I didn't have any money, so I came back. <laughs> I came back and I said, "Dad, if you really want me to go, you've got to give me some money to get there." And uh, so he did. He gave me a, a little bit of money, and uh, so I went back to Amarillo and uh, got hooked back up with Diane. And uh, it was uh, kind of like love at first sight. Aww. We just, uh, hmm. you know, we were just. Uh, Happy about that. Anyway, we got engaged whenever I was a senior in high school. And uh, from that point, I ended up, I was in the service, so uh, I missed, you can't miss, uh, we had training uh, things, uh, you know, like once a month, and uh, I missed three of them, and so I got my orders from Washington, D.C. to go... uh, active duty and uh, so I went from there to Vietnam 
came back from Vietnam. Wow. Got married. Ended up in Albu Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. And I worked for a company called TGNY Stores Company, which was a large, is like a Walmart mm -hmm. type of company. And uh, I just advanced rapidly as a young person uh, with them and ended up being one of their managers in one of their large stores. I did not go to college. And Diane and I, after, we got, after I got back, we, uh, we got married. We got married. We, we got, got married home. the last day of 1965. Oh. December 31st. New Year's Eve. I love yeah. that. I love that. That's super cool. But none of this time you knew the Lord. No. No. This was a different I, type of pastor. Field. No. Yeah. This was a completely different. The, the, this is not the field that <laughs> yeah. was back then. When so was, that was it that you background. finally found the Lord? Well, Diane and I had been married. She, Diane went to a Southern Baptist church, mm -hmm. uh, and I went with her uh, two or three times, you know, just to, just to be with her. Uh, the only reason I went to service was just to hold her hand and go on a coke date afterwards. <laughs> that's, the, that's the only reason I went. I heard nothing, you know, that the preacher was saying. I was too busy, you know, paying attention to her. her and, your girl. Yeah, and uh, just was waiting please hurry up so we can leave, <laughs> you know, type <laughs> thing. And, uh, but anyway, uh, she continued to go to a Southern Baptist church. And after we got married, I promised her that I would go with her, but I didn't, I didn't really go with her. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of times she, because I was not raised in a Christian home, we didn't go to church. And, and uh, so it was just a lifestyle that I had grown to be accustomed to and a part of is, not going. I would go with my uh, grandmother to a Church of Christ, and the Church of Christ was just uh, half a block from our house, and so I had met the pastor there, and a real nice guy, but I would just go in and eat the crackers and uh, <laughs> drink the juice. Was, uh, <laughs> and, and I liked to sing. I would go to, when I go with my grandmother, they would always have singing, and so I enjoyed doing that. So it's that. not like you weren't rejecting it. You just weren't No, in I it. just wasn't informed. Yeah. Nobody ever really talked to me about Jesus Christ. or, I mean, I knew that God was supposed to be at this house. And who was God? I had no clue. Mm -hmm. I just knew he was a supreme being and creator of the universe. I didn't know that. And, but uh, I, I didn't know him. I didn't know him personally or anything and didn't. All of my friends were just, uh, you know, they were non-Christians. Right, yeah. Some of them went to churches, but, you know, it was just the thing that they did with their mom and dad. It wasn't yeah. anything that they had a relationship with. Anyway, after Diane and I uh, had, we had been transferred. We were in Albuquerque first, and then we got transferred to Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, with my job. And uh, Diane was attending a Southern Baptist church that was not far from, from our house, and uh, uh, she would go there regularly on Sundays and, and Wednesday nights, and she would always, always ask me to go to church, and I just said, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to be a part of that. And she said, but you promised. And I said, I know, but I, it's just, it's just not me. My my life was, uh, uh, I went to nightclubs and, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing, dancing and, and uh, drinking and stuff like that. My dad, I was not of age. Uh, my dad... Uh, of course, you had to be 21 to get into the clubs and everything else, unless you had a parent that uh, that, brought you. that brought you and was a, you were a part of their table. And so I had been a part of my dad's table for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, he used to, uh, whenever I was really young, uh, I would play underneath the table that they were at and everything else. And what beer and stuff he'd have left in his bottle, he'd hand it down to me and I'd drink it. And so yeah. I got acclimated to alcohol and that sort of thing whenever I was real young. And uh, so that's what I did. And that's so going out nightclubbing and that sort of thing was my lifestyle. Diane detested it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure she did. She did I'm not sure like she it. She hated it. But she went with me and everything because. That was just a part of my life, and right. she wanted to be with me, and, yeah. and uh, that's what I did. And then, when did it change? 
they had a revival going on at their church, and she was inviting me to go to the services at night. And, but most nights I worked till 9 o'clock at night, so it made it almost uh, impossible for me to do, but I didn't want to go anyway, so <laughs> that was fine. Uh, she went up to the uh, to the man that was ministering, the, the evangelist, and said, uh, my husband is lost, and um, would you mind to pray for my, my husband? And he said, I sure will. And uh, that was on a Sunday uh, service, and uh, he... Um, he decided that he didn't want to just pray for me. He wanted to come and meet me. So he came to my home, knocked on the door. I was off that day, uh, and uh, I was still in bed. Mm -hmm. And uh, he knocked on the door. I came to the door, and he said, uh, I'm uh, the evangelist that's ministering at your wife's uh, church and uh, he said I'd, I'd just like to come in and share the Lord with you and I said well I'm really not interested and I said I, this is my day off and I'm resting and I, I said I just I just got out of the bed just to answer the door and he said well he said uh, I don't mind waiting and if you wouldn't mind he says I have a unique story that I would like to tell you about my life and uh he said, I was, uh, I was a member of the Mafia in Detroit, Michigan, and uh, that got my ear. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, I'd like to tell you about it, how, how I got out of that uh, situation. And so I invited him in, went, changed my clothes, came out, and he shared his life story with me. And it was very intriguing, showed me pictures of his life and where he was at. And, everything else. He controlled an entire block of Detroit and, um, you know, took care of all the gambling and the prostitution and all of this kind of stuff. And he was rolling in the, in the dough. Mm -hmm. To make a, a long story short, he eventually got out, but it was a miracle. They put a contract out on him to kill him. And, wow. And uh, anyway, he got, he got away from it, um, from them, and uh, but they went and hunted him down, found him. But after they found out what he had, that he had gotten born again, and all this kind of stuff, well, he, um, <clears throat> they just said, well, he's just a nutcase, and uh, we won't have to kill him. He's just a nutcase. <laughs> they just left him alone, so yeah. he'd go back every year and, and witness to him. <laughs> but anyway, I was intrigued by his story, and at the end, he said, Phil, he said, uh, would you like to? be born again would you like to to really know the lord i said i said i've been i've been around christians my boss at work is a christian but he hangs out the same place as i do mm -hmm. so uh, uh i see in you something different than i've seen in the people that i've been around and i said if i can have what you have uh, i'll take it and uh he said, well, let's pray. I said, well, I don't know how to pray or anything. He said, well, I'll just lead you in a real simple prayer. And so in my home, I got down on my knees and with him, and he just led me in the sinner's prayer, and I got born again and uh, accepted the Lord. And uh, after Diane uh, came home, uh, from, she was working, and uh, she came home from work, and as she always did, she said, Phil, she said, uh, we're... Our revival is still continuing at the church. Would uh, would you please uh, come to church with me? This guy is really, really good. And, and uh, I said, sure. <laughs> you hadn't told her. I hadn't told her. <laughs> she was ecstatic. I hadn't told her anything, didn't tell her anything then. Uh, anyway, he told me, he said, uh, he said, uh, will you come to, he said, I'd like for you to come to church tonight and uh, he said whenever I have the altar call I want you to come forward uh, and uh, you need to make a public profession of your faith and, and everything else and he said uh, uh, I will do that at that time that you have already you've already accepted the Lord it's just a matter you need to acknowledge it and uh, I said sure I'll do that uh, anyway, Diane doesn't know anything about this. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> and so we're at church, sitting in church. I went to church with her. But when I was at home, it was like 
when I told her that, she, I thought she hit the floor, you know. She just, she didn't know what to say. Uh, she said, okay, and started crying. And uh, we went in, got ready for church, went to church. And uh, when the end of the service came, he gave an altar call. So I get up and I walk down front and she starts bawling <laughs> because she thinks I'm going down to get born again and, and everything. And so um, he didn't, he, he just introduced me and he said, I met with, with uh, Philip today uh, at his home. And she didn't know anything about that either. And uh, he accepted Jesus Christ at his home. And, and so that's how it all happened. And then five years later, we got introduced to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And, and we were at another revival at, at a church in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, the the minister, the evangelist that was at the church. It was a it was a youth revival, and so it was the church. It was a very large church, and there was probably nine hundred kids there plus, you know, the parents that were there mm-hmm. and everything else. And we were there. We were standing up, and Diane said, "Phil, I need you to step out into the aisle." And she said, I, "I've." I've got to go down front. He was giving the altar call. The altar was filling up with kids um, in the church. And there was two adults that went down front, and she was one of them that went down front. And out of all the kids and the adults that were standing there, he turned and looked at her and said, why are you down here? And uh, he said, she he said, turn around, tell the congregation. He said, she said, I've come down to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, which was a shock to me. You thought but, she already knew the Lord. Yeah, yeah I yeah. thought she already knew the Lord. And uh, she said, while she was standing there, um, the floor just began to shake underneath her. And uh, she said, the Lord spoke to her and said, uh, you know all about me, but you don't really know me. Mm-hmm. And so... She went down and got born again. Well, at the same time she did that, uh, I went down front and uh, kind of made a rededication of my life to the Lord, and it just it just started from there, mm-hmm. you know. How do you take like all those experiences and your background and everything? How do you take that and then use that as? like fuel for your leadership? Well, when I served the devil, I served the devil 100%. When I served the Lord, <laughs> I, I've served the Lord with 100%. Once I rededicated myself and to him, it was, uh, it was a go from there. And then after I got filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, it really changed. My life really, mm-hmm. really changed. And, um, and I was still in the business world and everything else, but it came to that point in time whenever the Lord... Uh, I just had to make a choice. I was just miserable at my job, which I loved mm-hmm. prior to that. And my uh, my uh, district man uh, that I was under, uh, I became good friends with him. And uh, I just uh, made the decision that uh, I can't I can't do this anymore. I've got I've got to make. A, a commitment to the Lord that know what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do it, or anything else. So, after that, uh, it 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 affected me in such a way. After I really dedicated my life, I mean, I would share the Lord. It was just became a um, just a, a part of my life, and, and led a lot of the employees, you know, that I was working with to the Lord, and and the different stores that I was at, and. Again, we were we were having a revival at uh, at our church, and uh, people were laying on the floor everywhere praying and everything else. And I was sitting in a chair, and um, I felt like I had lead in my feet. I couldn't move my legs, and then I felt like something strapped me in over my arms, you know. And then I felt a hand come up on top of my head, and. Uh, and the Lord began to speak to me, and He said, "I've called you to preach." And He said, "You you need to 
to yield to me. And so I did. And uh, at the same time that was going on, all of a sudden the, uh, the music director that was there at the meeting turned around, looked at me and pointed his finger at me and he said, Phil, God's called you to preach. Wow, at the same, like, at the same, same time. Just almost, sound. the Lord spoke, then he spoke. And, of course, I didn't know that the Bible said out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established at that time. What did you think? I mean, were you like, okay, yeah, sure. Or did no, you have doubts? I was, or like, I, was, I mean. I was shaking all over. I was crying profusely. I couldn't even talk. I was, I was a mess. I was just a mess. I was just, I was so afraid. Uh, that's, I mean, that's the way I felt. I was yeah. just fearful. No, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. I'm I'm happy going to church and mm-hmm. and supporting and doing that sort of thing. But uh, standing before people to speak and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I I couldn't do that in class. <laughs> I would skip class. When I, we, yeah. when we, <laughs> Andy, me too. <laughs> I mean, I I would uh, just skip class. I knew all the monitors in the school. You know, they would come by and pick up, you know, the uh, the uh, attendance, you know, for that class and everything else. I knew all of them, so they had erased my name. Uh, you know, That's I hilarious. Wasn't there. I just couldn't do that. Just couldn't do it. I just couldn't talk in front of the people. Mm-hmm. Now, I could get around guys and talk, you yeah. know, and all that kind of stuff. And in sports and stuff, uh, it was easy, you know. I was a leader in sports activities and and um, but to stand up for the group was just in, no. And I knew that that's if you're called to preach, then that's what you're going to do. You're yeah. going to stand up before people, and I just couldn't do it. I just didn't. I didn't want to do it. Yeah. But uh, I surrendered nonetheless. I said okay, and that's when I afterwards I went. I, I worked for probably another two or three months, and then I just. Uh, it was it was Christmas. We didn't have very many days off in our business, and, and I worked 80, 90 hours a week. That was pretty average for me. And if you were in in the corporate part of the business, you just had to work long hours mm-hmm. um, in order because it was all about making the bonus and everything else. I made a decent income, but bonuses is where it was really all at. Mm-hmm. And so. Uh, I would spend whatever time was necessary to do that. And uh, anyway, we're, we were off on Christmas Day, and I never forget, I was, uh, our, our children were small. Our oldest uh, child was, uh, was we, only, we only had the one at the time, mm-hmm. was very young. And um, I saw him in the morning when he was asleep, kissed him goodbye, came home at night, he was already in bed kissed him, you know, good night, that sort of thing. But I was very seldom there when he was up playing around and everything else. Anyway, I was off that morning because the store was closed and uh, came in for breakfast, and Diane was making breakfast and everything else. And I was sitting at the table drinking a cup of coffee, and he got up and and uh, came in and... Uh, went over and grabbed a hold of his mother's leg and said, Mommy, who's that? No. Aww. Yeah. So Paul, my only son, mm-hmm. uh, he didn't he didn't recognize me, you know, because I, I just wasn't... You just weren't there. I just wasn't there. I was always working. And so uh, I made a decision right then. I said, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. Mm-hmm. This, this just can't go on. And... Uh, you know, kind of like owed my soul to the company store, so so to speak. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's it. Was just two weeks later, probably, that I went and turned in my resignation. That's when you turned in your resignation. I turned in my resignation, yeah. and uh, he said, "I said, uh, uh, you know, I'm giving my two weeks notice." And he said, "He said, Phil, are you sure that this is what you want to do?" I've surrendered to the call of God on my life, and he said, well, I fully understand that. And uh, he said, man, he said, if it's between the company and doing what God told you to do, do what God told you to yeah. do. So I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. Well, I hadn't gotten 
hardly gotten home, and I got a telephone call from uh, another company in Houston, Texas, and um, that they found out that I was no longer with the with company. That company. That was quick. And so like <laughs> and it, it, it was a different kind of a company, and uh, but it was still in a retail type fashion, and they had a store that was really struggling, and said, "Would you come down to Houston?" and take over the store. I said, well, I've just gotten out from all yeah, this. Yeah, right. And they said, no, here's your hours. He said, you won't have to do anything. We want you to run the store and take care of it and everything else. We just lost the man manager. It's a brand new store. It, it had a pharmacy and all this kind of stuff. It was, it was like a CVS. Mm -hmm. Right. It was called Super X Drugs. And um, so... They said, don't say no, we want to fly you to Dallas, and uh, we want to meet with you in Dallas. And so uh, I did, I flew to Dallas, and I met with them, and they offered me, uh, I couldn't refuse offer type thing. Mm -hmm. So I went there and I said, look, I'm not staying in this, I'm going into the ministry. And I said, I'm, right. not, I'm not ready yeah. yet, but I am going into the go into the ministry. I've just surrendered my life uh, to that. And they said, that's, that's fine. We only need you about two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... So you worked the two years? So I worked the two years there. And that's where I really got started in the ministry. I got to meet Brother and Sister uh, Osteen. And okay. it just started from there. Yeah. yeah. And we're, was in a lot of services with a lot of the the old time, yeah, yeah, you know, Pentecostal guys that uh, Fred Price, you know, uh, Brother Hagen, Charles Caps, people like that, yeah, and uh, it just it just blossomed from there. I got involved in a spirit filled church, um, got filled with the Holy Ghost, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that was five years later after I really accepted the Lord, and. Uh, that's where ministry began. And then worked in my church that I was at uh, and was uh, ordained and launched out from that church mm -hmm. in the Houston area. Then from there we went to Phoenix and I was working with another man in Phoenix there in his church. And then I started my own uh, and then turned that over uh, to someone else. And I worked with another minister uh, in uh, Scottsdale area in Phoenix and then from there uh, I ended up going to New England where I ended up spending 28 years 28 years yeah. at the same church right same church, the yeah. same church how'd you get here how'd you find us well my daughter lived lives here okay. and uh, oldest daughter and uh, we would come down for the conventions and stuff okay the, the Southwest Believers Southwest Convention. Believers Convention and, and the pastoral Thing at Brother Copeland's, and okay, and um, uh, we did that for years. And uh, uh, Brother Copeland wouldn't remember, but when I first started in ministry and everything else, I preached at their church. Oh, really? Yeah, I did. That's wow. cool. Yeah, when uh, John Ziegler and, and uh, them were were over, uh, John and Ginger Ziegler were over the the ministry part mm -hmm. at that time. So I knew John and Ginger real well from Houston area. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, we ended up speaking. That's awesome. So, so and then from from there, we, uh, uh, anyway, we would attend all the conventions mm -hmm. and stuff. And so when we would attend the convention, um, because she lived right over here, we just came to Dr. Savelle's. You know, to the church. You know, and you and visited. You were and visited. Just visited. Yeah. Yeah. We would just go and visit. Tiffany came here. She left from up there. And she came here and she went to Bible school here. Oh, nice. Anyway, so we came here. Um, and it was so much like the church that we pastored in New England that uh, we, didn't, we didn't know what we were going to do. Everybody that I knew was up in New England. Mm -hmm. All the, I mean, we could have stayed up there and just ministered around up there. Uh, but uh, 
Tiffany called me up and she said, Dad, she said, uh, whenever the Lord speaks to you to uh, leave the church, I said, well, he may never speak to me to leave the church. You know, she said, well, if he does, <laughs> if he does, she said, I'm building a new home. And the home that I'm building, I've got you and Mom in mind. Mm-hmm. And I want you to come. She said, I'm a nurse. Who's going to... Who's better to help take care of you than me, of the three kids? And uh, I said, well, that's true. I said, but, you know, Tiffany, I I don't know what the Lord's going to say. And if he'll ever release me from here, if I just die here, you know. And uh, I said, I'm committed to the church, and and, uh, I just don't know what the the Lord's going to say. Well... The Lord uh, spoke to me and uh, and uh, told me that time was coming to an end. And, so she uh, had put her request in. And yeah. Her <laughs> Father she God had heard that yeah. request. She put her request in and uh, everything else. And then my grandson, mm-hmm. uh, he called me and he said, uh, Paul, Paul, uh, you know, New England has had you for 28 years. It's my turn. And how can you say no to that? I couldn't say no. <laughs> Especially if the Lord's already talked to you yeah. about it. Yeah, I, I had come down and married him and, uh, and everything else. And he just said, Papa, he said, I just, you know, I'd like to have some time with you. And, uh, of course, we have other grandkids. Other yeah, than sure. Than those and uh, than him. And, uh, but he was the first mm-hmm. and uh, so when it came time for us to, to leave and everything else I said Lord it's coming to a close and everything else you said it's coming but when mm-hmm. and I didn't get a time or anything so I just waited and then the Lord spoke to me and I told Diane I said Diane I said you're going to have to talk to Diane because Diane was so so committed any any place we've passed her, she uh, she was just so dedicated and committed to the church. Uh, well, I said just, you're going to tell her, yeah, because it's going to be hard for her to to leave her home. Uh, we built a home, a really nice home, up into the mountains mm-hmm. up there, uh, and uh, and that that was her home. And so to uproot her from her home, I said you're going to have to uproot her, not me. <laughs> You had to let her know, and and because uh, we didn't take want to take much stuff with us because we were coming to Tiffany's house and it was already yeah. furnished. I'm just sitting here listening to like 41 years of ministry, and wherever the Lord sent you, you went, and you guys plugged in 100. percent Just like you'd said, like you serve the devil 100. percent You're going to serve God 100. percent So. Thinking back on all those years, what was it, what is it in you and Pastor Diane that leads to longevity in ministry like that? Well, I I think, you know, for, for, it's, it's not a job, it's a lifestyle, it's, it's a way of living, it's Mm -hmm. something that you commit to for, for your life. Uh, The gifts and the callings are God are without repentance. I mean, he's not, God never changes his mind, you never... You never stop uh, ministering and, and sharing the the word of God. Uh, it's just like I used to tell our congregations: preachers don't retire; they refire. They just it's just a refiring. Mm-hmm. You just move in from one dimension to the next dimension, and whatever layer that happens to be, and wherever you're at. And so, moving to here was there was no aspirations. There was no uh, we weren't looking for title positions or or anything like that. Uh, when we talk to pastor, uh, you know, we just, uh, it, it's just a way of life. I mean, you're committed to the Lord and you just, the duration is just till till death do we part. Yeah, we, right. And you don't part. Yeah. Right. You just step out from one dimension to the next dimension. So so Heritage has really been a refire for you. Absolutely. What it, has it been like to come under a vision that's already established. Sounds like you went, you planted, did a lot of planning, but this has been different for you, has it? 
uh, what's well, different from the fact that I don't have all of the uh, the oversight and right. that sort of thing. Um, I think that's one of the things that Pastor kind of looks to me for is because mm-hmm. we've we've done it for so long and we've made our mistakes and so why yeah, why wisdom. make the same? Yeah, yeah. Why not share those things and so that you can help others? So the big question, our motto is winning in life. What does winning in life to you mean? And what does it look like in your life to be winning? Well, I think that's just life as a, as a Christian. Uh, we have the victory, period. Mm-hmm. And uh, we should be winners in every area of our life, in our spirit, our souls, our bodies, our domestic things. Um, he made all the provision for it, so we need to be an example of that type of a lifestyle, you know, and uh, so that others can see in us that uh, serving the Lord is, it has value and it has, uh, uh, I mean, that the Word works. It, it just works. Not that we don't make mistakes in our journey and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we all make mistakes in our journey, but... Uh, it's just when I'm when I made the, the decision to really serve the Lord, uh, I was just in book, line, and sinker. That's it. There's no turning back. Nothing can dissuade me, yeah. turn me away, or anything else. Uh, I'd it, say that's winning in life. Yeah, being 100 percent committed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Well, well, it's just been a treat to hear your story and hear like the the long-term life of faith. I mean, it didn't start there, but nobody really starts there. And it's neat to hear the way it it just kind of weaved together and how Pastor Diane was with you the whole way. Absolutely. um, We're really excited to sit down with both of you in the future. It'll be fun to have Mm -hmm. two of them here. Thank you so much for joining us. This was a wonderful conversation with Pastor Phil. Um, Be sure to tune in next week when we go through our next, with our next guest.